guys. Hi, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for those of you joining in the room, for those watching through the World Wide Web. Thank you, Matt Nathanson. Thanks for, uh, for coming through. Good to see you. Awesome. Thanks for coming. So as they told you, we're going to talk for a little bit up here, and then we'll take questions from you guys. So think about uh, what you want to talk to Matt about. Um, good to see you. Yeah, great <laughs> to see you. Good to catch up. Um, so you were saying before we came on, you're sort of coming down the, the back stretch on the, on the tour. Yeah. Um, how much, you know, as you go through a tour, how much do you find things evolve and, and change for the set and things that you get tired of or things that all of a sudden are getting a, a you know, bigger response than you expect? Once you're, once you're going, what starts shifting around? Yeah, what's fun is as we move through the tour, we get a little bit more adventurous with arrangements, we get a little bit more adventurous with song choice, and we get a little bored with certain songs that you think, when the tour starts, there's kind of this, oh man, this is incredible, we're gonna play this, this will be the opening song every night. And by like week six, you're like, why don't we never play this song again <laughs> in the history of my life? And so that kind of thing happens where it's just certain songs, touring songs, they really become like, wow, this feels like a keeper, and this was a real miss kind of thing, and you start to, adjust well and you know i was looking i was looking back to see and you've been you've been making records a long time started now. when i was <laughs> nine right i mean i was then like okay matt's been making records and looking back like oh that one before that one you know it's a, it's a lot of stuff now yeah. to, to look at so when you're you know how do you think about putting a show together out of is there stuff that you sort of dig way back in and pull out is there yeah. stuff that um, I mean, how do you look across that span of stuff and make it make sense? Yeah, there's certain records that feel like haircuts that you never want to never want to wear again, like the mullet phase. I've got a couple mullet albums, and uh, so those really, it's hard to pull songs out of those records, like way back when you were a kid banging on an acoustic guitar and reading your diary entries. It was like, it's hard to go back to those. And so... On a tour like this, where it's a co-headline and we're playing kind of big show, big shows, outdoor shows, certain kinds of songs really, really throw in those kind of places, and they really translate. And then a lot of songs um, just don't. And so the, it's sort of that's nice because it limits the, the pool. But then I did a tour last fall where I had a big Elvis Costello. I stole an idea from Elvis Costello. And we built a huge wheel, and we put all these. I had everybody vote on songs uh, and uh, on Facebook and stuff. And uh, we had the wheel was full of songs that, like, man, I never knew if I was going to ever play those songs again. And that worked out well. And some of it was also like when it comes around to a song you wrote when you were 17, makes you want to jump out the window. <laughs> so, uh, so I kind of try and do it both ways, where when the shows are big and the kind of outdoors, we have the kind of the bigger songs to pick from. And then we do these small acoustic tours. It's fun to be able to, uh, you know, just sort of dig deep. So the place, the, the, the setting and the space and the context, that matters a lot. Because you could just say, I'm going to put my head down. I'm going to bring my best. And it doesn't, wherever I am, that's what I'm going to bring. But In my next life, I'm going to come back with a confidence level that allows that to happen. Like, I watch Ryan Adams do it, or I watch, you know, certain people, Neil Young, another person who just sort of, they just go out and they just do what they want to do. And uh, for me, I sort of feel like the, the shows are more of a like, communal experience, right? People have taken time out of their day, they've taken money out of their pocket, they're coming to the show, they're hanging out. I sort of feel like I'd like to give them a, an arc, I'd like to give them like an experience that feels less about me doing something for me and more like, you know, I'm already doing something for me. I get to play music. I get to sort of be with my band. I get to interact with people. But to me, the joy of the live show is sort of like bringing people along in this journey and not necessarily playing something. Sometimes I'll do something just for my own self. But it's really like, feels. Ex I like to be inclusive. And I like the idea that the shows feel like an inclusive experience. And shows for me that I've always loved have done that. So even in songs that maybe people don't know, I'll tell a story to kind of bring people in like folk people used to do, you know, Greg Brown and those kind of people. So I like that idea that we're all in the soup together, that kind of thing. I mean, the, the, 
sort of co-headlining structure is an interesting thing. I mean, you're out with, with Philip Phillips, and it seems like a different, if you're out headlining and it's clean and it's your people, you sort of know what that is. If you're going into a festival or somewhere where you know you've got to, like, pull from whoever's around and, you know, that's a, there's a sort of plan of attack, I would imagine, for that. This must be a funny sort of in-between thing to try to navigate. Yeah, sometimes it works really well. Most of the time with Phillips fans, it's worked really well because our fans kind of like the same kind of stuff and so they switch over nicely between the two of us. And then a great big world's been opening up and it's nice. It's been, a, when it works well, it is really fun. And when it works poorly, it's like watching people that lost a bet. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like there's certain people in the audience, like some people are having a great time, our fans are out there, and then there are people that just look pissed off that they're there. It's the most fascinating like social experiment ever. You look out and they literally look like they've been put there, they've been told they can't move, <laughs> and, uh, and that if they smile, they'll be, you know, whatever, they'll be like taken out and waterboarded or whatever, you know, so. But like, it's incredible to see, and, and I'll try really hard to include them. And then there's been a couple times this one guy in Ohio just stood up and was like, I was like, I said something to him that was sort of jokey about being on his phone. And he just snapped and stood up and was like, you go by, and I was like, oh my God. I was like, sir, you look confident enough to wear that shirt that you're wearing. I think you should be confident enough to sing along, you know? And he was like, rah, rah. and the whole rest of the night. And so at the end of the night, I finally, I blew him a kiss. You know, it's like, <laughs> <clears throat> or there were these women in Seattle, this mother and two daughters who were sitting, and they just looked like so, and I was like, how are you guys doing? And they were like, meh. And then at one point, they just started covering their ears. Like, like I've been, in my life, I've been crueler than anyone I've ever known, pretty much. Like, in my life, in the arc of my life, I've been a pretty sizable dick. And I don't think I've, <laughs> and I don't think I've ever been to a show where I've been that much of a dick. Like... <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And, uh, they started, you just started going at them. Well, and, well, as soon as they cover their ears, at a certain point, I started to feel empathy for them. It went so far that I started to be like, oh my God, these people have deeper problems. This, than, is, this is not about this me. This is not this me. Is about Holy me. shit, you know? And so, that, so that, one, that one went to empathy. The guy that was standing up talking to me about something, I don't know what he was saying. I had my in-ears in, but I just, started to, I just started destroying him. And, I, and every time I would sort of loop back around and be like, everybody having a good time except for that fucking guy. <laughs> You know, and they'd be like, and the guy would just be like, ah! So for me, that's gold. I like, bring it on. I love that. Takes on a whole it's, life of its yeah, own. It's like, it's, it becomes the show. Like, yeah, right. how much can I totally just ruin this guy's night? <laughs> um, <laughs> not, with, not the stories you thought we would get to. Um, so in terms of that, like, this sort of changing relationships to the material thing, I mean, let's talk some about the record oh, yeah. as it looms here behind us. Spooky. Uh, <laughs> extra, extra creepy. Yeah. Guys. Um, you're now, you know, nine or ten months off of release, right, of, you know, since this thing's actually been gone in the world, obviously, living with it, you know, before that. Yeah. How does, usually I'm sitting up here and it's somebody whose record just came out that no. week, yeah. and they're at that moment of, like, it's been our thing and now it's the world's and we'll see what happens. Um, but, you know, now that you've been living with that for a while, and you're yeah. still, this is still the new record, but you're out there with it, how does that, um, you know, again, how does your relationship to that evolve as that goes through, as it goes in the world, as you see a response to a single, as you see a response on stage, you know, do you have that same, like, wow, that one I never thought was going to turn into this kind of a song, or this over here, that I should have left alone, or and, and those may change and, and come in and out of focus, I would think. Yeah, there's a song on this record called Washington State Fight Song that when I wrote it, I felt really proud of it. I felt like, uh, wow, that's so, I was being unguarded and I was, all the stuff that I love about music, I was like, we got the lyrically, I'm really saying what I, and I mean, that song in terms of like people's feedback, it's one that just sort of is like crickets. You know what I mean? And then there's songs that, that I kind of finished and was like, was like, ah, oh, man, I didn't get that one. That one, I missed that one. And people will be like, that's my favorite song on the record. So if I, 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 it's this crazy thing. There's two songs on this record that have really, well, there's three that I'm super proud of that feel like kind of forever songs, which is a neat thing because sometimes I make records and I'll tour them and then at the end of the tour, it'll kind of be like, wow, I don't really want to revisit many of those songs. But there's a song on this record called Giants and there's a uh, song on this record. Thanks, Mom, Dad. 
a song called Giants, the headphones from this record, and then there's a song, you guys are great. Pick up your check just as you go out, go left. <clears throat> and then there's a song called Bill Murray that's my favorite song. And so those songs, it's neat to have moments like that where maybe they didn't necessarily connect on a commercial level, but they feel like forever songs. That's a really cool feeling. And do you get used to, do you ever get used to that weirdness of, of not knowing how it's going to resonate in the world? I mean, is that something that you, over time you learn, like, okay, I, this, is, this is the best I got and let's see what happens? Or is it always release day as a weird, like, let's see where this is going to go? It's been happening lately more now than ever where the record comes out and I'm already writing for the next record because <clears throat> I try very hard to make my life feel like there's not these schisms, there's not these like like moments, it's not like I'm going on tour, I'm making a record, I'm at home. I try and make it feel like it's all one big part of itself. And so that was this was the most liberating record in that way, where the record was coming out and I was already working on these new songs. And, uh, and that felt cool because all the people that I really respect, and you know, you go through this, doing this as a job, but really mostly as a fan, right? I'm a fan, you know, we talk about music all the time. And so it's like, all my heroes are always creating and always do that. And, and I would make records and I'd be like, I don't get it, I don't know why I can't do that. I'm always like putting the record out and feeling like this is it, this is the prize fight, let's do this. And now as I start to get a little bit further along, I feel like this, this synergistic sort of keeping everything as a moving entity, writing while I'm touring, while I'm at home, you know, uh, it just feels better, and it feels like it feels very Woody Allen. It feels less of a the movie is of paramount importance, and boy, it's got to do well. Woody is always on, kind of moving on to his next film by the time that his film wraps, and so that's kind of that idea. So you're able, you write, you write all the time. You're able to write on the road. You're yeah. Right. Is it? Did that take learning how to do that, or is it? Are you just somebody who works like that? No, I feel like. Um, I like to think that I, I'm like a constipated writer. I need, I need like my Metamucil, do you know what I mean, to like get things going. And so on tour, my writing, uh, my writing, it drops a little, like my, because on tour you're sort of, it feels a little bit like, how am I gonna get food? What am I doing? How, how do I, where do I poo? You know, like, and then, uh, this has been incredible, a lot of Metamucil talk. Do you know what I mean? Like, touring becomes a lot of like, how, how am I going to do the basics? Yeah. And then, but, but, uh, but the writing still happens. And then when I'm home, I can really kind of dial in to the writing a lot. It, it, so it goes like from about 90% and then on tour it drops to about 65, kind of like, but always writing, yeah. And this record, you went in with a, you know, a, a, a pretty clear strategy, or at least, you know, you knew there was a, in terms of how you were building these tracks and, writing the rhythm tracks and working in a different way. Um, first of all, what did you, you know, what do you take away from that? I mean, is that something that then stays with you as a piece of the writing moving forward, or does that feel like, okay, that's what that was about? And also, you know, do you need to sort of make a, a challenge around each project? Yeah. Does each one go in with, okay, let me try this thing this time, or, you know, what's the, how do the, the, those pieces kind of fit together? Yeah, it kind of is a little bit of both. So things always carry forward, you know, but a lot of times um, the records I've been listening to now are so different than the records I listen. You know, every, things are evolving at this rate, and the singer-songwriter thing that's happening now is really exciting with, like, John Bellion and, like, Jack Garrett. There's just this sort of, like... Um, electronic-based singer-songwriter thing that's really feels vibrant and vital to me. And so um, this record was a lot of track-based stuff. This next record is going to sort of start as mostly acoustic songs that then we kind of build out. I'm still, it's like, it, you're always... So you're going to turn that Flip around. it a little bit, yeah. I sort of feel like it's just always in pursuit of the combination. And every time you finish one record, you feel like, oh, yeah, I know what I did wrong, and I know what I did right this next one's gonna be it. And then you never get it, you know what I mean? You're always like, you always fall short. And so this next record, I sort of feel like, you get this confidence, you're like, I got this, man, this next record's gonna be the one. This is gonna be my Tracy Chapman, Tracy Chapman record, you know? Like, or the record that like defines the artist, right? And, uh, and then you end up just with a record with, you know, so who knows? I, but you gotta say that, 
you got to have that sort of confidence level because it's, it motivates you and it makes you feel like you can do anything, that kind of optimism. So I kind of try and keep that. So did you find, was there on, on, uh, on Show Me Your Fangs, was there a song, was there even a moment in a song that felt like you could feel it click, like it could come into focus and say, oh, okay, I, I know what this, I think I know what this is going to become. Yeah. So the song Giants for me is a song that really influenced my new batch of songs too. I sort of feel like I'm not a political human being like as a writer, but I feel like as human beings, it's really hard to listen to someone sing about their relationships unless it somehow plugs into a larger frame of like humanity. Because we're just in this time where artists really aren't speaking up about things uh, in any way. I mean, on a like they are hip hop, like Kendrick is and that kind of stuff, but like in my, kind of music nobody is it's just like everybody's writing like baby baby I miss you and it's like super boring but being like a straight white man I have kind of an obligation right because I have this privilege that comes with being me and so if I don't somehow open the floor to people that don't have that privilege I'm not doing my job as a human and I'm not being I'm just not like stepping up and I sort of feel like if the music doesn't somehow reflect this idea that like we're all in this together and we also have to listen to people who are different than us and we have to unite even in our, we have to coexist and we can listen. Like I feel like all that stuff has just been blowing my mind up lately. And like we were talking about Jesse Williams' speech at, at, at the BET Awards and Beyonce's performance and Kendrick. I mean like there's just something that's not happening in pop radio, there's not something that's not happening in singer-songwriters. It's like it's all so up its own ass that I sort of feel like if somebody can, and I'm not saying that I'm going to be able to pull my head out of my ass, but I'm saying if the music doesn't include a larger framework of humanity and how we can all be together, I sort of feel like it's missing the point. So that, uh, you know, I imagine the people in the room given their response know the story, but to give you the platform for anybody at home, do you want to tell the headphones story a little bit and yeah. what was what's behind yeah the idea headphones. And the, and the execution there. yeah that was a fun experience because headphones I wrote about I wrote that song about music and how music I like music more than I like people I joke about that but it's true like music has always been there for me music has always been a, a supporter of me when I was a kid and my parents kind of weren't the best at being parents I had music you know and so the idea of the song headphones was life is better when you have your headphones on. I feel invincible with my headphones on. And then we went to shoot the video in Huancayo, Peru, with a hearing aid company that go on these missions, Starkey, and they do these hearing missions where they give away um, hearing aids and they give away the batteries and the, you know, like the upkeep and maintenance. And they do this all across the world. And so we thought, wouldn't it be cool to take the money from the video and spend it on them? And so I went to Wonkayo. They do it everywhere, and so I met them in Wonkayo. And we spent uh, two days kind of fitting people with uh, earphone, or, you know, earpieces and getting them to be able to hear for the first time, and, uh, or it, the first time in a long time. And it was one of those moments where you realize that the world is so much bigger than your, than your life, and that there are human beings that have these experiences that you don't even begin to understand. And so it, like, it brings the empathy level up in you, and all of a sudden you realize that we're part of a global community, and that we are actually all part of this, each other's lives. And, and in America especially, it becomes very myopic. It becomes very like, this is us, this is what I want. Don't take anything from me. If you get something, if you get kindness, if you get empathy from me, it's coming from me and it's extracted from me and I don't have enough of it at the end of it. If I give you my, you know, it's like that idea. People don't want to give anything up because they don't want to feel like they're losing anything. And it's this crazy concept where you're around these people that don't feel like they're losing anything by giving kindness, by giving love, by giving empathy. And it's like that teaches you that fuck, man, we, have, we could do this so much better, you know? And so the headphones video was a revolution for me, and it wasn't really, I didn't have anything to do with it. I just got to show up and help, you know? But what being around these people, doing this good work, and these people receiving this work, it was heavy. Uh, maybe related, and maybe you're sick of th discussing this, um, and this will be, I'll do this question, and then we can go to you guys. But, um, but I am curious, it's now with a little bit of distance from it. Um, what did... You know, what did having a song like Come On, Get Higher yeah. mean for you just as platform? I mean, what, 
you know, outside of the moment of, here's a hit, I go on TV, I'm doing this thing, I hear it on the radio, I'm going to the drugstore and it's playing in there, you know, once you're out of that, what does having that on the, you know, on the resume then actually change for you? It's a pretty great question because when it happened, I, I, you kind of feel like, oh my God, this is great. I put out four or five albums at that point, but the song happened and I was like, oh yeah, this is it, this is the moment, here we go. And then all of a sudden it was kind of like, that was the biggest moment I've had at that point. And I didn't really soak in how great it was. And so now, to be able to play that song to people, to be able to still tour, to have people coming to the shows, to have built this following, and have that song as like one of the linchpins in this career that, that supports my family, that supports my, me doing what I love, I have such gratitude for that song, man. And it's like, every time we play it, which is every time I play, <laughs> it's like to see people respond to it and to see people, it's heavy. It kind of brings me to tears when you see, because it's just a, because as arrogant as I've been in my life, I've never been confident. And so when you see people singing something back to you that you wrote and feeling it, and it feels, at these shows, it feels universal. Like even the fans of the other bands, they sing it and it feels like, oh my God, people know this song in this particular strata of the universe. These people know this song. It's like, I can't, I can't be more psyched about it. You know what I mean? It's like, because that's all we ever, all I ever want is to connect. All I ever want is a song that I write that comes from me to connect with people where they, on a universal level, on some universal level, right? I understand the sm small, bigger, biggest, but like to connect with people on that level, that's hugely validating because uh, I've spent my whole life feeling like I want to be validated by people, on a, right, on a certain superficial level. You're getting up there and give me the mic. Right, it's, it's kind of like, you know, look, I got this hole to fill, and like, I'm here for you, but you just got to give me something back. And to be able to see people respond to Come On Get Higher like that, it's like, fuck, man, I think I almost, I had one of those songs that was like sort of a moment, you know? And I don't hear it as much as like, people be like, I heard you in the whatever, you know? <clears throat> but for me, it's just like super, super gratitude, like unbelievable. All right, here front and center in the Matt Nathanson shirt, that would be the one. Hi. Hello. Awesome. My name is Lizzie, and I, my brand new husband and I are looking forward Yay. to setting sail with you next year on yeah. a cruise with a bunch of your the friends. The train cruise. Train does a cruise, which is the train cruise. Yep. And uh, my question for you is totally related to one of the songs on the new album. Have you gotten any feedback from Bill Murray? Have you, what inspired him as the totem character that you are following? And I have to say, it's really, it's a beautiful love song about not missing out on chances. Because, like I said, we've been married three months. We met each other, and we actually got engaged on the cruise last oh, this yeah. past year. So it's about taking it's about taking chances, and we both love it. And yeah. congratulations on all your success. Oh, thanks. Can I? I don't know if they get it on the screen or not. Can I say she's in the Matt Nathan shirt and he's in the ACD? I know. Shirt. This is like <laughs> this is how it works in my brain. Jeez. Um, as a as a metal fanatic, you have no idea. Um, so Bill Murray came up because I had written this chorus lyric that said, let me be your man. And I thought, I, I emailed actually my friend John Darnielle, who I've known for a long time, who's in a band called The Mountain Goats. And he's one of my favorite lyricists. We went to college together. And I said, can I get away with saying, let me be your man? Like, that just feels like something Prince could pull off, but I can't. And I said, and, and he kind of gave me sort of a little bit of support around it, because I felt real self-conscious. Like, I, w I don't think I'd ever say to someone, let me be your man. That's just not something I would necessarily say to anyone ever. I might say something like that, but never like that. And so I started sort of building this story about Bill Murray, because I'd been asked in these interviews, if you could, if you could hang out with a famous person, who would it be? Right, ever since the Kardashian thing started happening, people have really liked fame more than anything. And so I don't really have any famous people I want to hang out with. I like famous people's work. I don't necessarily need to be any new self-absorbed friends. And so, but I thought like, Bill Murray, man, that guy seems unself-conscious. You know, everything you read about him, he just seems like he moves from a passionate place. And so I thought, 
I would love to be, what if the song was about Bill Murray? And then what if the song was about me and Bill Murray hanging out for a hundred days and traveling the world together and this guy just raining down wisdom on me, you know, at every turn. And, uh, and so anyway, so the song started out as kind of a love song and then it evolved into this idea because how much I kind of look up to Bill Murray and the way that he's navigated the waters. And so to answer your question about has he heard it yet, I, I have a couple people that are real close with him, but I've hesitated reaching out. Um, I don't know why, because I think it's more fun to talk about Bill Murray than it might be to know Bill Murray. I don't know. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's sort of like, for me, it's the, it's the, it's the, it's what he represents is so incredible. And for me to put that on him as a human isn't fair. Do you know what I mean? And so I really, it's like, I would love him to hear it. I would love to tell him how, you know, but it's like, but I don't have that urge to like, you know, it's just more of a concept than it is of a thing. And he represents to me, I don't know what he's actually like, but what he represents to me is something that's extraordinary. You know what I mean? And so it's fun to be able to have that connection with him on that level, yeah. All right. Hi, my name's Jocelyn. Um, so my question is this. Little Victories is one of my favorite songs, and Giants is one of my favorite songs. So what is your most giant victory? My most giant victory? It's a mashup. That's great, I know. That totally feels good. Uh, I would say my most giant victory had a lot to do with my wife not leaving me. Uh, and that had a lot to do with her being extraordinary and also me kind of just barely making it work. So I would say my most giant victory is that I, because I grew up in a situation where I didn't necessarily, I wasn't, it was all, it was me for me. And so when my wife and I finally figured it out and then we had a kid, all of a sudden I realized that like we built this little tribe of people that where it was like you get love and support unconditionally, and I'd never had that. And so all of a sudden, uh, so that's my greatest victory is that I get to go home to them and they get to come on tour with me and we get to sort of not have any secrets from each other and we get to just sort of like exist. It makes me, uh, it makes me happy every time I think about it. All right, we can do one more right here. My name is Patty and I don't have a question. I just have a little story that's gonna make Matt laugh. Um, all right. You know, because your Washington State fight song just made, reminded me of it. Yeah. I put your album on my granddaughter's MP3 player. Oh, no. Yeah. I forgot to take Washington State yeah, fight song off. There's definitely a fuck in the first verse. Yep. In guess, the first line. Get, guess what she learned. Oh, yeah. <laughs> She's 18 months old, and she sings your song perfectly. Oh. <laughs> All you can do is put it out there. This is what I'm saying. I feel like that's an accomplishment of sorts. <laughs> Teaching, my, teaching the kids. Teaching my kid. My kid and said. My son is just like, Mom, get that off the phone. I can't believe you did that. It's better now than later, I figure. Yeah, my kid is definitely well versed in vulva, <laughs> vagina, fuck, shit, ass. And you said, as a Pogues fan. Yeah, right? Oh, so, so, yes. So, my daughter, early in her life, I got her into like, first she started with Fleetwood Mac Rumors, then she moved into Peter Gabriel So, then she got into If I Should Fall From Grace with God the Pogues, and so much so that she recognized Shane McGowan's voice when we were in a restaurant in the bathroom. I was taking her to the bathroom, and she goes, is that Shane McGowan? And I was like, win. Your job, your job is done. I was like, no. it, it can be raffy from here on out, as long as I've got the fundamentals in place. Oh, all right. Everybody, thank you for joining us here out in the world. Dude, thanks, Alan. That was awesome. Thanks so much. Dude, good stuff.